I want to take one slide to talk about my research at uh, College of Vet Med NC State. I call this the farm to genome approach. That's fun. Uh, so what I really do is we, the research really starts at the farm level. Okay, so collection of samples. Over the last three or four years, I've really started to focus a lot on the environmental aspect of sampling because I think a lot of these key questions about antibiotic use, antibiotic resistant development, I think some of the key answers are there in the environment. So once we have the different pathogens, I've Focus mostly on pathogens that have a public health impact. So, for example, Salmonella, Campylobacter, Clostridium difficile, that also have an impact on, on the animal side. Uh, it really starts with characterization and finding what are the different antibiotic resistance profile of these different pathogens. So, uh, test these pathogens against a panel of antimicrobials that are commonly used in humans, commonly used in animal side, to see what is the profile. Then, once I have those drug resistance profiles, I want to find out what is causing those pathogens to be resistant? Is it a gene that is present on a plasmid? Is it a gene that's present on a chromosome? So on and so forth. And then uh, we also do a lot of uh, fingerprinting. Okay, so is the salmonella from environment very similar to what you're finding in the pigs? So on and so forth. Uh, there's a diagnostic aspect also that I have, uh, and then it kind of loops into back and we're using those diagnostic tools to on-pump sampling and testing. But I'm really interested in the global epidemiology of these pathogens. I don't want to know, I don't want, I've, I need more information than what is present, what per type of, uh, say, Salmonella clone is present in North Carolina. I want to compare that to what is present in, say, Iowa. And then maybe take it outside the United States, what's present in the UK. So look at how these pathogens evolve and how are they changing the dynamics, whether it's virulence genes, whether it's drug resistance profiles, and what is causing them to become resistant to these different antimicrobials. So why am I interested to talk or work in the area of antimicrobial resistance? Because there is good funding in it. Okay, that's one reason. But the main reason is I think it's a very interesting field. It's a very dynamic field. It's changing every day. We find about some new drug resistance genes, so on and so forth. It's covered very well by the media. So there might be more people dying on the road by accidents. But if one person dies because of contamination or infection with a drug resistance strain, it's going to be on CNN and so on and so forth. It's very interesting. It really intrigues me. But the main thing is that we always tend to focus is what is the role of animal industry in transmission of these pathogens to the food products? And how safe is our product? You know? And so that is really what I'm interested in. And I'm going to talk about, show you some data about on this particular area. And Really, the data and the information I'm going to share with you is based on my research, uh, based on other people's research, but I think I hope you'll find it very interesting. So I call it antimicrobial resistance lost in translation. So I had a lot of thought process, should this be the title of my presentation? So as I move quickly towards this phase, the question I always ask is, where are we in comparison to this different, to these small pathogens? You know, overall I believe the pathogens are way more smarter than us. And the simple reason for that is they have a very simple genome. They quickly adapt to the environment, they quickly make changes, and I'm going to show you some data how fast they evolve. So here's an example how good bacteria go bad. Okay. So this is a family tree of E. coli and Shigella enterobacteriaceae. Uh, so if my family tree is going to be very different from your family tree, uh, but here's a very good example of how these pathogens talk to each other. So you can see, ideally speaking, all the blue E. coli should be clustered together. But as you can see in this particular image, there are a bunch of Shigella that have kind of gotten themselves rooted into the family tree of E. coli. A very good example about how this group of Shigella has looked so much like E. coli that is coming in between the regular E. coli in the family trees. So they, these guys are more closely related to this bunch of E. coli than these four together. Okay? Here's an example of how a regular common vibrio made changes in its cell wall, and every time it made some change in cell wall, it resulted in a pandemic. Okay? So right now, as you can see, Sixth pandemic, seventh pandemic, eighth pandemic, simple changes in his genome. Some, some aspects of cell wall have been changed, and guess what? We have a pandemic. Okay, so again, an example of how quickly pathogens evolve, make changes, and cause problems for us. 
This is the trend of emerging infectious diseases over the last uh, many decades. Uh, it's around decade old, but it gives you a good snapshot of what we are dealing with. So what we have over here is pathogens, uh, overall infections caused in humans by fungi, protozoa, viruses, so on. Here is a group of diseases caused by zoonotic pathogens. Here is an example of drug resistance strain and an example of vector borne disease. And as you can see, over the last few decades, the infections caused by zoonotic pathogens and the infections caused by drug resistance strains has drastically gone up. Okay, so it could be because of more interaction between human and animals. It also could be because of better detection and techniques that are now available for us. But something to keep in mind how these infections have gone up over the last few decades. The other aspect I always want to stress is antimicrobial resistance is a global problem. It's not a local, regional, th regional thing, it's a global issue. And here's one good example of a recent new drug resistant gene that emerged in, in the South Asian uh, uh, continent in India. And what was going on over here is infections in patients caused by this new gene, which is a metallo beta lactamase, causes uh, resistance to uh, fourth generation cephalosporins in humans. These cases are popping up in India and in UK at the same time. Okay, so when they talk to the patients in UK, they found out that all the patients in UK had traveled to India within the last one year. So what they were doing was they were going to India for cheap surgeries. So they would pick up this new resistant gene that had emerged in local Indian hospitals. They were picking it up and bringing it back to their countries. And now we have the new, the first indigenous uh, salmonella strain in the United States that has this particular gene that was reported from a hospital in Baltimore. So as you can see, what has happened is in this period of time, this gene has jumped from E. coli and Klebsiella into Salmonella already. Okay, conferring resistance to fourth generation cephalosporins. Again, highlighting that drug resistance is an international problem. Okay. So I'm now moving into an important aspect of my talk about use of antimicrobials for growth promotion purposes, so on and so forth, emergence of drug resistant strains eventually potential transmission to the human side, okay? But what I want to stress over here is, you can take any form of agriculture. You can take any aspect of food processing, food retail, food service, home or humans. We are exposed to these antimicrobials, disinfectants at different states. Okay, so it could be fungicides, antibiotics, sanitizer, disinfectants, biocides, so on and so forth. I'm not highlighting an important aspect over here in humans. The amount of antimicrobials that are used for treatment in hospitals, uh, we don't find a lot of information on that. That is a missing, very important key that we are missing in this important uh, question. Okay. So how many of you in this room fell sick, went to the physician, they gave you a bearer pill to swallow for 10 days, 5 days you are feeling okay, you stop taking the pill. Okay, I have done that. And so what has happened in the meantime is you are basically selected for a drug resistant strain in your gut and taking those antimicrobials probiotics for five days, you have cleaned the susceptible population. Okay, so that is a very important aspect that I want you to keep in mind. So one of the key thought process that we have now is that we use antimicrobials for prophylaxis growth promotion in the animal industry, is why don't we take it off? And that's going to result in a susceptible population, and then everything will be very nice. Okay, so I collaborate with a lot of physicians, whether it's from Duke or UNC Chapel Hill, uh, because they are close by, and, and some of them give very big, strong blanket statements. So one of the physicians one day just told me, Sid, if you take off antimicrobial use from the animal industry, everything will be okay. My job would be easier. That's what he told me. Okay, so, so that's, uh, again, a thought process uh, that, as Dr. Norman mentioned, will take more participation from them to really... It's a thought process. It's not something that's going to change uh, overnight. It's going to take a lot of discussion uh, with the public health side to really make a key change in their thought process. So here's, here's, here's what we see. So thought process is that you have pigs. If they're not exposed to antimicrobials, they are going to shed susceptible strains, any pathogen that you have. If you fall sick with them, you give a treatment, you are happy. So the hypothesis is, based on survival of the fittest and so on and so forth, you expose these animals to antimicrobials, 
All of a sudden, they start shedding antimicrobial resistant strains. We fall sick. We treat with different antimicrobials. Guess what? Nothing's going to happen. We are continuing to be sick. Okay. Now, the next line in that is, well, if you, if you, if you stop exposing these different these animals to antimicrobial, uh, antimicrobials, ultimately, they're going to revert back to a situation where these animals are going to start shedding susceptible population. So the thought process, you ban the use of antimicrobials, everything is going to be okay. But as I will show you in my research, is that is not really the case. Okay? Uh, whether you expose the animals to antimicrobials or whether you do not expose to antimicrobials, uh, it's not making a lot of difference. And I'll show you some data. It's very well published. Uh, you, I, I can provide you access to those articles if you've not seen them already. So what I've seen is this environment is very, very important. That's why in these kind of discussions, I think we need to bring in people from environmental microbiology area, public health area into the discussion. Because what I've seen in my research is the environment plays a very, very important role in back and forth transmission of these drug resistant strains between animals and the environment itself. Okay, so what we have seen is because of this back and forth going on, we still have these drug resistant strains that are being shared by the animals. What is the environment? Air, water? Or? Anything that an animal is exposed to. So in case of pigs, it could be the floor, it could be the feed, it could be the water, it could be the truck that are used to transport the pig, anything the pigs come in contact with. So I want to move on to the next stage of my presentation is reservoir of antimicrobial resistance. So I'm going to highlight some of the work that some other people have done, very interesting work, about how environment plays a very important role. So we always tend to focus on the commodity. What is that animal shedding? What is that uh, the human shedding? We never talk about the environment. Uh, that is also reflected in very few studies that are focused on environmental microbiology, uh, for example, in a swine farm or in a poultry barn or whatever it is. Uh, so we need to bring them into the loop. So limited research conducted. We need to focus more on the environment. And look at, study the different environmental factors or the reservoirs. So food animal, the farm environment, for example, it could be lagoon, truck, larage. In case of produce, it could be water used for irrigation. It could be birds. It could be the manure. In humans, it could be the hospital environment. It could be the community. So uh, now I'm going to present two in very interesting studies that have been done, uh, published in Science and Nature. Uh, so this is one study in which this group of investigators, what they decided to do is they wanted to see what is there in the soil. Okay. So they went to urban areas, they went to rural areas, they went into the forest, collected soil samples, brought it back, used the metagenomic approach to find out uh, what is going on, also used the microbiology approach. So these are soil bacteria. Uh, could be a fungi or whatever it is, but they are typical soil bacteria that are living in the soil. So what did they find? When they, when they tested this different soil bacteria against the panel of antimicrobials, they found out that on an average, these soil bacteria were resistant to seven antimicrobials. Okay, these are soil pathogens we never pay attention to. But if you look at where all these antimicrobials are actually coming from, most of them are coming from soil fungi. Okay, either if they're not prepared in the lab, then they're coming from soil fungi like streptomyces, uh, penicillin, so on and so forth. So majority of them are resistant to minimum of seven antimicrobials. When you break down these different antimicrobials and look at the key antimicrobials to which these soil pathogens were resistant to, they include tigacycline, erythromycin, ciprofloxacin. You can see ciprofloxacin is very high. Uh, even vancomycin. So vancomycin if you know, it's really the last line of defense that we have for treating infections that are uh, not being cured by other, other uh, pathogens. Usually physicians don't recommend vancomycin unless it's really absolutely needed. Uh, so again, a good example of what is there in the soil is we need to look at more closely. So, so when we grow a particular pathogen in a lab, uh, we always take a petri dish, have a media in it, we streak the culture on it, we stick it in the incubator. So that particular media is, what it is doing is providing a source of nutrition, uh, primarily a carbon source that they can utilize in addition to agar and so on and so forth. So these group of investigators, what they, did, what they thought is, what if we take off that nutrient from the agar medium 
and and substitute that nutrient with different antimicrobial media. Okay. So instead of using nutrients, they supplemented those particular agar with antimicrobials, different antimicrobials. And then they decided to streak these different cultures on those plates and wanted to see how these pathogens react to that. So initially what they found out was these pathogens were not able to survive. Okay, first of all, they did not have a nutrient source. And second of all, they had an antimicrobial mixed in the media. Okay, but here's the interesting aspect. Soon they found out that these pathogens started making changes in their genome. Okay, to the point that they started using these antimicrobials as nutrient supplies. Okay, so they started feeding on these different antimicrobials. Okay, so you can see over here, these are the different antimicrobials that they tested. Look at this, vancomycin. Over a period of time, close to 100% of the different cultures they were using, starting consuming vancomycin as a nutrient source. Okay. So that's what I meant, how fast these pathogens evolve, how fast they, they make changes in the genome, and how fast they react to their environment. Okay, it's a very fast process. The other thing about this aspect is that if they like this change, if, if it makes them better fit, then they like to keep those changes in their genome. And I will talk that in relation to fluoroquinolone use in the poultry industry and why we still find fluoroquinolone resistant Campylobacter from retail meat in the United States, even though it's been banned for use in the broiler industry since 2004. So the role of environment is very important. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about uh, one study we published in Applied Environmental Microbiology, where we wanted to see how a pig environment uh, impacts what we found, what we find in a pig, and eventually what we find from the same pig in the slaughter plant, so the carcass of the pig, okay? So if you know that, and I'm assuming everybody in this room knows what the all-in, all-out production system is, where you have these trucks that are picking up the pigs from farrowing, taking them nursery, and then eventually to finishing. So as part of their uh, TQA, which is a transport quality assurance program that these different companies have, they have to wash and clean the truck before the truck goes to pick up a new group of pigs, okay? So they cannot take a dirty truck to a farm to pick up pigs. So what we did is we went to four different truck wash stations in North Carolina, and we sampled the dirty trucks, 10 trucks per station. We sampled the truck floor before it was cleaned. We trampled the same truck floor after it was cleaned. So we took swabs from the four corners and the center of the truck, and we wanted to check the profile of Salmonella and Campylobacter from the truck floor. Uh, we also were sampling the same group of pigs that were transported on these trucks from one farm to the other farm. So we're sampling the pigs. We wanted to sample the pigs at the farm. We sampled the truck before and after cleaning. And we sampled the same group of pigs at the slaughter plant. Okay. And we looked at Salmonella and Campylobacter. Okay. So here are the four different truck wash stations. So this is pre-wash, post-wash. So A, B, C, D, 10 trucks per truck wash station. Look what is going on truck wash station number D when it comes to salmonella, okay? The after cleaning was actually, salmonella was going up as compared to before cleaning, okay? The so truck wash station D was using recycled water and a phenolic compound to clean it. Okay, so, be, so basically, in a sense, what I'm saying is maybe the dirty truck floor was better than the clean truck floor, okay? <laughs> yes. From the same truck floor swabs, we also isolated Campylobacter, okay? 100% of the swabs were clean, were, were positive for Campylobacter on the same truck was station after it was cleaned, okay? Now, here's the interesting aspect about why the environment is so important, okay? When we sampled the same pigs in the slaughter plant, the carcass, what did we find? We found the salmonella and Campylobacter isolated at the farm level were different from those isolated at the slaughter plant. Okay, so the population of Campylobacter salmonella that we isolated from the fecal samples of these pigs were different than what we found from when we sampled the carcass swabs. Okay. Isolates from the cecum and mesenteric lymph nodes were similar to those isolated from the truck floor. Okay. So Scott Hurd has very clearly shown that pigs can pick up salmonella from the environment and start shedding the same strain of salmonella in 30 minutes. Okay, in 30 minutes, a pig can pick up salmonella from the environment and start shedding the same strain. So what was going on over here is 
These pigs were picking up salmonella and campylobacter from the truck floor, and by the time they went to the slaughter plant, they would start shedding the same strain. Okay, so here we are. I'm moving into another area of how these pathogens have created their own unique niche in different environments and how dominant they are. So one strain of salmonella that is present in the slaughter plant, when the farm population comes in, this slaughter plant salmonella is going to completely wipe out the farm population, and that's what you're going to see in the carcass. Okay, I'm going to show you evidence for that. We have also shown very clearly that in a swine farm, how different uh, serotypes of salmonella can exchange plasmids and can exchange these different resistance genes. So here's a group of pigs, same group of pigs. We isolated two different serotypes, typhoid medium and munition. They were penta resistant. So ampicillin, canamycin, sulfamethyptomycin, sulfamethoxyl, tetracycline. We found out that all these different genes coding for these five different antimicrobials were present on plasmid. And then both the serotypes had the same plasmid. Okay. They had the same plasmid. The conjugation assay, we found it against canamycin. The canamycin probe went and bound at the same site. So again, a very good evidence that yes, these, path, these pigs can exchange these different plasmids if they're in a closed setting. But the key question for us is, even if they do that, is it really transferring into the human population? So I'm going to move into that slowly now. Because I think that is the key thing for us to really answer. answer. So with that background, I'm not, not going to talk about the DANMAP data. Okay, so I'm not talking about what's going to happen, let's say, in the United States if we stop using antimicrobials for growth promotion purposes. Because I know there's a lot of different focus groups who are working very hard for this thing to happen. Take off antimicrobials for growth promotion in the animal side. That will clear the problem. We'll not have any more drug resistant strains. And as a consequence of that, we'll have an improved public health. Uh, and uh, that will really help us a lot. So Denmark, as we know, is the leader uh, really in this area in the European Union. They banned the use of antimicrobials for growth promotion in the animal industry in 2000. And subsequently, it was followed up by European Union in 2006. So DANMAP, I, I applaud their hard work. They're, every year they come up with this data about, about what's going on in the food animal industry and the human side in Denmark. So here's a snapshot of... What has happened in Denmark over the last, starting from 1990 to 2011, keeping in mind that in 2000 is the year when they banned the use of antimicrobials for growth promotion. Okay. So one thing that has happened is once they came up with the bans, before that you can see uh, these bars over here, antimicrobial growth promoters were used in the food animal industry. But after 2000 when they banned, the first thing that really happened is the prescribed veterinary antimicrobials started to go up. Because especially in the pig industry, what happened is Lawsonia, Iliitis, they came back with a vengeance. Because when pigs are not given these antimicrobials from a prophylaxis purposes, you know, especially the piglets and the nursery age pigs are going to suffer. And that's what they happened. So what, what did the veterinarians do? Well, they had to prescribe more antimicrobials. So for example, tetracycline use, the therapeutic use of tetracycline went up by 110% in Denmark. We have also seen an increase in the pig production in, in, in Denmark, close to 30 million pigs every year. Um, so that's a snapshot of what is going on in the pig industry. Now let's start looking at the profile of antimicrobial resistance in salmonella typhimurium in pigs in Denmark over the last uh, 10 years. Okay. So this is typhimurium, which we, as we know is one of the biggest problem when it comes to human infection, uh, it's, it's salmonella is the number one cause of bacterial foodborne illnesses every year in the U.S. Uh, 1.5 million cases every year, but if you talk to statisticians, they say you can multiply that number by 38, trying to counter for the underreported cases that happens every year in the U.S. So it causes a lot of infections. It's always in the radar. So here's what what we have. This is where the, the antimicrobials are banned for growth promotion. But you can see, sulfonamides, tetracycline, ampicillin, resistance, even after banning of the antimicrobials in Denmark, is still going up. Okay, you can see that. It is still going up. So antimicrobials for growth promotion were banned in 2000, but up to 2011, you can see resistance to the important antimicrobials, as reported in typhimurium, is still going up. 
Okay, so the question is, why is it still going up? The thought process that you ban the antimicrobials, the resistance should start coming down, but it's still going up. Okay, so that's one thing. Now, this is Typhimurium antimicrobial resistance in pigs, pork, and human cases. Okay, so I've already showed you this particular site where ampicillin, a tetracycline sulfonamide is going up. This is pork that is indigenous in Denmark. You can see there's a big spike very recently in tetracycline and sulfonamides and ampicillin. This is pork that is imported, so 25% of the pork in Denmark is imported from countries that use antimicrobials for growth promotion. Okay. It's going up. Uh, the human domestic sporadic infections resistant to different antimicrobials has gone up and uh, obviously humans uh, travel abroad also have a high frequency of resistance to salmonella. So again, some to think about why is that happening? You have banned the antimicrobial use in pigs and in, in food animal industry, but we are still seeing resistance levels go up. Here's Campylobacter jejuni. Uh, so Campylobacteriosis, uh, the number one risk factor for humans is consumption of poultry. That is the number one risk factor for getting infection with Campylobacter. The second uh, risk factor is travel abroad. Okay. So you can see in broilers, for example, ciprofloxacin is still going up. Fluoroquinolone is very, very important from a human angle for treatment of human cases. And I will show you the, the data from the United States, uh, retail meat data after these slides. But the key thing to keep in mind is we still have ciprofloxacin resistance going up. Tetracycline resistance isolated from broilers in Campylobacter is still going up. And then you have other, other aspects like broader meat that is imported, uh, domestic human, human traveling abroad. But again, there are spikes that are going up. So the so key thing that really you get from this graph is why is the resistance still going up? Why are the infections in, uh, resistant to Campylobacter in humans also going up? Okay. Keep in mind that the common link here is consumption of poultry being the number one risk factor for getting infection with Campylobacter. So here's one of the reasons why maybe Campylobacter that is resistant to fluoroquinolone in human in Denmark is going up. Because if you look at the consumption of, of ciprofloxacin, it's going up. So the human side, ciprofloxacin use is going up. Maybe that is the reason why we see more Campylobacter resistant to fluoroquinolones isolated from humans. So it's, I'm going the back way over here instead of saying we have more in animals so we have more in humans. I'm saying we have more in humans over here as compared to more in animals. Because in animals, we are not using ciprofloxacin. So this, the Dan map 2011, what is the key, key things we find out? Use of tetracycline in the Danish pig production has decreased over the last two years, while the occurrence of tetracycline resistance continues to increase significantly. Okay. So subtherapeutic use is already gone in 2000. The last two years, even the prescribed antimicrobials are going down for tetracycline, but still we are seeing more resistance to tetracycline in Salmonella. Resistance to vancomycin and quinpristin dalfopristin persist at a low level among Enterococcus faecium isolated from pigs, even though avoparsin and virginiamycin have not been used for more than 10 years. Okay, so avoparsin was never used in the United States, but it was used in the European Union, but we still find resistance to quinpristin and vancomycin. While the level of resistance is typhimurium isolated from Danish pig continued, the gradual increase observed over the last year, the resistance in typhimurium to Danish pork increased significantly more dramatically from 2010 to 2011. So in the last one year, they have seen a very significant jump in resistance to different antimicrobials in pathogens that are isolated from pigs. And this is a scenario where pigs, where no antimicrobials have been used over the last 12 years now. So where is this coming from? One of the drawbacks of the whole DANMAP system is they don't, they don't do any sampling or any testing of the environment. Okay, I think there is already a big reservoir of these drug resistant strains in the environment. And if they start sampling the environment, I think they will get some of these answers uh, to the questions that they have. Okay. Now here's the NAMS data I want to show you. This is United States data from the National Antimicrobial Resistance Monitoring System. So every year in 15 states, uh, they go to different uh, supermarkets, collect 40 samples, they process them for four different pathogens, and I'm showing you 
uh, and they re uh, uh, release a report every year showing you the levels of resistance in different pathogens and different meat products. So this is what we have. So around, approximately around 40 percent of the total retail poultry meat that is sold in supermarkets in the U.S. are positive for Campylobacter jejuni. Okay, so if you buy, you know, 10 different, you know, chicken breasts, at least four of them will have Campylobacter. It's a very big number. It's a very big number. That's why it's the number one risk factor for getting infection with Campylobacter. Now here is the, in 2004 is when they banned the use of, therapeutic use of fluoroquinolones in the poultry industry in the United States. So Sarah and endofluxes that were used for treating cholibacillosis in, in broil industry was banned. But if you look at, and this is the resistance out of these different ice samples that are positive, these are the resistance to ciprofloxacin over the last five, six, six years. So this is the latest data that is available, and you can see the ciprofloxacin resistance in, in Campylobacter isolated from retail meat in the United States is still going up, okay? even though antibiotic use was banned in 2004. Okay, so again I will show you why. So the thought process is, if you take off antibiotics from use, a stage will come when these pathogens are going to get rid of these resistance genes. Because the thought process is, is these different genes carried on a plasma or a chromosome, they cost these pathogens a lot of energy to maintain. Okay, and so it's, the, the analogy I give is, let's say you, you go on a trekking expedition, you have a big backpack with you. You come down from your expedition, you go to your office, you're not going to carry the backpack with you because you don't need it anymore. You don't want to carry that extra weight. So it all boils down to what I call the pathogen fitness. Okay, how fit a pathogen is to carry that extra weight as compared to other pathogens. Okay, so Kijing Zhang from Iowa State University did a very interesting study to check the fitness of these different strains. Okay, so what he did is he, he took three different sets of uh, broiler birds. There was no fluoroquinolone selection pressure in this model, so there was no fluoroquinolone use. Okay, so what he did is clean birds with one he injected fluoroquinolone sensitive Campylobacter jejuni. When he collected the fecal samples the next, the next day, all he could isolate was fluoroquinolone sensitive Campylobacter jejuni. When he used fluoroquinolone resistant Campylobacter jejuni, all he could isolate the next day was fluoroquinolone resistant. When he mixed both of them together, and when he gave it to the birds the next day, all he could get was fluoroquinolone resistant Campylobacter jejuni. Okay. So what is going on over here is the fluoroquinolone resistant Campylobacter jejuni is ecologically better fit to survive as compared to fluoroquinolone sensitive Campylobacter jejuni. And when I say it's ecological better fit, it means it can compete better for nutrients and the environment as compared to the susceptible population. So what is happening is this resistant population is wiping out the susceptible population and this is exactly what I think is going on. We, we have already selected for this drug resistant, ecologically better fit strain of Campylobacter and that I think is why we are finding more and more number of Campylobacter resistant Campylobacter fluoroquinolone resistant Campylobacter from broiler meat and poultry meat in the U.S. and in the Dan map data also. Okay. All right. So with that huge background, I'm now going to start talking about my USD and EFA study, a four-year study which we just completed. Uh, we have already have started publishing the data, in which we compared pigs that are antimicrobial exposed. So these are commercial pigs raised indoor. And we compared them to an antibiotic free pig that are raised outdoor and no use of antimicrobials. But if these pigs fall sick, they have to be treated, but then they lose their ABF status. So, so this group of pigs are, are your typical product that you will find, say, in Whole Foods. They're sold under naturally healthy hog or naturally grown pork. They are regulated by third party to make sure that they are following the recommendations and the requirements to have that status. And then we compared three different pathogens, Salmonella, Campylobacter, and Clostridium difficile from these two group of pigs. So I want to just take you quickly through a sampling aspect of what we did. And we just did not sample the pigs. We exhaustively sampled the environment. And we found a lot of key answers that were there in the environment that we would have missed if we had not sampled the environment. 
So what we did is we had 10 cohorts of pigs. We have 35 pigs per cohort. And what we did is we, we ear tagged these pigs uh, when they were when they at the piglet stage because we wanted to sample the same pig as it moved through a production system all the way to slaughter. So basically we wanted to see the dynamics of these different pathogens within a cohort of pig as it moved from one farm to the other farm. Okay. So as a consequence of that, we sampled the pigs at 8 days, 6 weeks, 10 weeks, 12 weeks, and 26 weeks of age. The last sampling was done 24 hours before they go to slaughter or processing. We sampled the, the trucks before and after uh, that were carrying these pigs to the slaughter plant. At slaughter, we again sampled the truck. We sampled the larage floor where the pigs were placed. So larage is the resting area. The pigs have to rest before they enter the processing line so that they are, whatever stress they had during the transport process is reduced because increased stress leads to increased shedding of the pathogen. So reduce that, they rest in this area. We, we sampled uh, the mesenteric lymph nodes. We sampled the post evisceration. Once the guts were taken out, we took carcass swabs using following the USDA recommended method. And then we sample uh, the, the pigs when they were at post chilling. So once they go into the slaughter plant, they're chilled down before they are caught. Uh, so we sample the, the, the carcass post chilling also. Because chilling has shown to have a very drastic, a very good effect on reducing the number of pathogens that are present on the carcass. We did a, did a lot of environmental sampling. So feed, water, floor swabs, lagoon samples, soil sample, truck. At the slaughter plant, we sampled the larage, the truck. So, and we sampled the environment. And whenever we sampled the pig, we sampled the environment also. So every pig was sampled five times at the farm stage, and then once at the carcass level. So we sampled the environment every time. In the antimicrobial free system, we had eight cohorts of pigs. Uh, that we sampled uh, on the same farm. Now keep in mind these pigs are outdoors, they are at the same pasture, they are the pasture rotation system, they move from one pasture to the other, they are pretty much in the same area. We sampled the truck and then we sampled uh, them again at the slaughter plant. Uh, we also sampled a lot of environment, so it's water feed samples, uh, <coughs> soil sample, truck samples, just about anything we, can, we could lay our hands on. So this is a slide, it's a, it's a heavy slide, uh, but I want to show you what we found when we isolated Campylobacter from commercial pigs and out of free pigs, okay? So this is the drug resistance profile of Campylobacter from pigs. The green bars are antibiotic free, uh, the dark bars are conventional. These are the different antimicrobials we used. So this is what we got from the pig, this is what we got from the environment. So let's look at the green bars. So these are pigs that have never been exposed to antibiotics in their whole life. Azithromycin, ciprofloxacin, erythromycin, gentamicin, tetracycline, nothing in fluorphenicol, nalidixic acid, telethromycin, clindamycin, and multi-drug resistant strains. So MDR strains are strains that are resistant to three or more antimicrobials at the same time. Okay? Telethromycin is very interesting. Telethromycin is a ketolite. It's never been approved for use in food animal industry. It was approved for use in humans by FDA in 2006. Okay, but these outdoor pigs and the commercial pigs were resistant to telethromycin. We got the same profile from the environment. Now, if you look at these two graphs together, they look like mirror images. Okay, if it, there's not a whole lot of difference. They look like mirror images to each other. So the thought process is, whether it's antibiotic free pig or it's commercial pig, there's a very healthy back and forth going on, exchange of these pathogens between the pigs and the environment. Okay. So if you look at the outdoor antibiotic free pigs, it doesn't make any difference if you don't use antimicrobials. There's such a load, heavy load of these drug resistant strains in the environment that they are picking up from the environment and then they're shedding them at the same time. So. We had the same kind of profile in Clostridium difficile. So what, what I think is going on is we have antimicrobial exposed, antimicrobial free. We have the pig A of the environment. There's a back and forth of antimicrobial resistance strength between the pig and the environment. And they are the same strains. The strains, drug resistance strains we found in commercial pigs. They're very similar to the drug resistant strains that we found in antibiotic free pigs. Okay. And I'm going to show you some phylogenetic data now 
as to what I indicate by that. So this is the Campylobacter population tree uh, uh, or ancestral tree that we, we found, we detected in this group of pigs. So these are the commercial pigs and the antibiotic free pigs all clustered together. Okay. So you can see they're all clustered together. So if you see this big circle with this four different colors, that means this Campylobacter was present in all the four different stages, whether it's antibiotic free pig at farm, slaughter, commercial pig at farm, slaughter. So then I thought that maybe this might be a mistake. So let me now see if I pick up the unique Campylobacter that I found only in commercial pigs and the unique Campylobacter I found only in the antibiotic free pigs. What's going to happen if I put them together in the tree? So these, these were unique in the way that they had different resistance patterns. So they were different from each other. When I created a phylogenetic genetic tree using both these unique clusters, I found out that they were actually again clustered together. Okay, a very clear evidence that even if they had different resistance patterns, they were still part of the same family. Okay, so the bottom line is Campylobacter in commercial pigs in North Carolina and in antibiotic free pig are actually the same population. And that is why they are also drug resistant at the same time. <coughs> Here's an example of Clostridium difficile that we isolated from the same pig drug resistance profile. This is ciprofloxacin. You can see 100% of the ciprofloxacin we found from antibiotic free pig from the environment and from the farm were resistant. So the question is, these pigs have never been exposed to ciprofloxacin, why are they resistant? Well, the answer is, again, we have to look at it from a different angle. Clostridium difficile is intrinsically resistant to ciprofloxacin. Okay? It's intrinsically resistant. So whether you give it antimicrobial or not, exposing antimicrobial, it's not going to make any difference. It is resistant. So that's the other angle that we always tend to kind of not keep in mind is some of these pathogens are intrinsically resistant to different groups of antimicrobials. It doesn't make any difference whether you expose them or you don't expose them. They're always going to be resistant. Now I'm going to talk about, I think I have seven more minutes. I'm going to talk about ecological niche. Okay how different unique strains of these pathogens have created a niche for themselves. It's like they, they, they are in the environment and say, this is my house, and you're not going to come in my house. And I'm going to show you evidence what I mean by that. So here is, here is the salmonella we isolated from this big USDA study we talked about. So we did serotyping from NBSL and we got the results. So here is what we found on the farm, and the antibiotic free site, and the commercial site, and this is what we found at slaughter. Okay, so let's look at Salmonella infantis. We did not find that in antibiotic-free farms. Not in the pigs, not in the environment. But look what happened to infantis when we reached the slaughter plant. Boom. All of a sudden, infantis appeared in the slaughter plant. Okay, so it's like, the, it's like Salmonella infantis is waiting for these pigs to come to the slaughter plant. It's there on the floor of the larage. The moment the pigs come in, they get inside the pig, and that's what you're going to find in the carcass also. Okay? So here, a, a pictorial of what I meant to say, and I'm showing an example of Salmonella and Campylobacter when I talk about ecological niche. So what we have found consistently over the last 10, 15 years, at least in North Carolina swine farms, is that on the floor, so they are both typhimurium, on the floor and inside the pig are both typhimurium. But this one on the floor has a different drug resistant pattern than what you usually find inside the pig. Inside the pig you have the typical penta resistant DD104 phage type profile. But on, on the floor what has happened is we, have, we find this MDR pattern that is resistant to only three antimicrobials. So streptomycin, sulfamethoxazole and tetracycline. So one would Imagine what is going on on the swine barn floor that we always find this strain of salmonella on the floor and not in the pig. Why don't we find other types of salmonella? So what is going on is this particular group of salmonella have what is we call as efflux pumps. Okay, so efflux pumps are pumps. Their only job is when they get when the antimicrobial enters into the bacterial cell, they pump it out. Okay, and, and what is the common substrate that activates this efflux pump is the disinfectants. So when you're disinfecting the swine barn floor, 
what you are actually doing is you are activating these efflux pumps. So you are killing everything else that does not have an efflux pump. But this particular strain of salmonella, since it has an efflux pump, it is able to survive and kind of made a very solid niche for itself on the swine barn floor. You don't find that in the pigs. Okay. Here's another example. And this is a very strong example of ecological niche in Campylobacter. So it doesn't make any difference what camp type of Campylobacter population is there in the swine farm. Okay? Doesn't matter what's on the pig, in the pig, what's on the floor, it doesn't make any difference. Because once these pigs go to the slaughter plant, there is a very, very dominant population of Campylobacter that is present in the slaughter, slaughter plant, a processing plant, larage, or the resting area. This population of Campylobacter is so, so dominant that it, it 100%, there is a 100% change in the population dynamics, what is found in the big gut on the farm, then when it reaches slaughter. This population completely overwhelms the farm population of Campylobacter, completely wipes it out. And we have, we have phenotypic evidence, we have genotypic evidence. To the extent that what you find in the carcass is what you find in the slaughter plant larage area. Okay, it's a very fast process. Okay, I mean, I'm talking about a couple of hours over here. A complete change, a reversal of population of Campylobacter that is coming from the farm to the slaughter plant but gets completely overwhelmed by what is there present already inside the slaughter plant. The quick example of what I've indicated by the same type of salmonella fingerprint that we are finding in antimicrobial free system and in commercial system. So A is antibiotic free, C is commercial system and we can larage, fecal, floor, larage, lagoon, water lagoon. This tachymurium is widespread in the whole region. Okay. So irrespective of the production system, we are finding the same type of salmonella typhimurium. My last two slides are, are, are dealing with the key issue of, you know, what's happening when we, when we, you know, spread the swine manure and the transmission of pathogens and salmonella, so on and so forth, into the environment, trickling down into the fresh produce and we consuming that contaminated fresh produce and we falling sick. Uh, so we have just started a study, we also received some fun funding from the pork board. And the preliminary data is, is kind of very encouraging. Okay, so what we have done in this is, we have, we have started sampling in five commercial swine farms. And I stress on the word commercial swine farm because most of the data that you will see are mostly coming from experimental field stations where they have sampled, they spike that with a particular pathogen, then they spread that and then they measure it and they come up with the report. So I thought that I don't want to do that. I want to see what is going on on an actual commercial swine farm. So I really have to, you know, applaud the swine industry of North Carolina for supporting me in this research. You know, it's not very easy for me to go and say, talk to a swine vet and say, I want to come to your farm. I want to find salmon lard getting disseminated in the environment and then I want to publish those results. <laughs> That's not a very good conversation to have with them. So finally, after five or six years of my trying, they finally said, okay, said, you know what, get off our back, do the study. They gave me five swine farms, and we have done sampling on two farms so far. So what we are doing is, on, on every farm, we have five different plots. And we, we take soil samples from these five different uh, plots of land. Before the, the, the lagoon manure is sprayed, then we take another sample immediately after. Then we come back a week later, and then we come back two weeks, two weeks later. So we have four different sampling from the same lot of land that we, we take these different soil samples. We are also collecting lagoon samples. Uh, and so here's what we have found when it comes to salmonella. We have hardly found any salmonella from the first two farms that we have sampled. Okay, and this kind of rolls back into my experience with dealing with antibiotic free pigs, where I found out these antibiotic free pigs or on an average very clear clean of salmonella because we don't find antibiotic free pigs a lot of them positive for salmonella we also don't find a lot of salmonella in the antibiotic free pig environment what I want to indicate is that I mean to say that salmonella salmonella does not survive well in the outside environment okay and this is also replicated over here before maybe a little bit after less than 2% goes away day 7 comes back in day 14 it could be just a statistical thing immediately after yes, but day 7, day 14, so on an average, you know, salmonella is not surviving well in the outside environment. Uh, it's not there, 
and we are not able to find it. So we'll see what comes out of the next three rounds of sampling, but the first two rounds of sampling clearly indicates the Salmonella is not able to survive very well in the environment. 315, right on time. So to summarize my talk, I think we have to move away from this generalized discussion. Let's take off antimicrobials. It's going to solve the whole problem. Okay. I think we have to be more focused. If you really want to have a good dialogue on this, you want to talk about which food animal, for example, you're talking about and which pathogen you're talking about. Okay, so for example, it could be, let's talk about solving the antimicrobial problem in broiler industry, and I'm talking about Campylobacter. Then, yes, I'm going to talk about that. But at the same time, I think we also have to talk about what is going on on the human side. I think that is very, very important. The, uh, the human aspect and their contribution to drug-resistant pathogens, I think, is very, very important for us to understand. And that's why I think we have to bring the public health people on board and to have this healthy dialogue with them. And not to shy away from taking any responsibility if you really want to have a meaningful uh, discussion on this particular topic. I've talked about the unique aspect of pathogen niche in specific environments. I think that's something we have to really keep in mind. So if you ask me if I want to deal with Campylobacter, I may have a different type of protocol to deal with Campylobacter, maybe at the farm site as compared to the, to the slaughter plant site, because I think there are different populations we are dealing with. Uh, renew our focus on the role of environment. And Dr. Dorman talked about how we uh, didn't have a lot of participation from environmental uh, people, and I think that's very important. And my data has clearly shown that there's a lot of cool stuff going on in the environment that we, we really don't have a very good handle on. We need to get some more information and do some more work from the environmental side. And antimicrobial resistance is a global problem. I think we cannot just restrict it to one local area or to a country level. I think the example from India that I really showed you is how quickly these guys can really spread and can jump from one side to the other. Thank you.